I want to ask you all to open your Bibles to 2 John. 2 John. Last week we talked about 1 John. Uh, this week we're going to look at uh, 2 John and 3 John. And, and these chapters are super, super short. In fact, it's only one chapter. Normally we would, we would not even say chapter 1. We would just say 2 John, verse, whatever. But today we're going to be uh, looking at 2 John and 3 John. But I want, to, uh, I want to zero in on 2 John first. I titled this, Lifestyle That Pleases the Lord. Lifestyle That Pleases the Lord. How to Glorify Through Our Living. Let me just say a quick prayer before we begin. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to look upon your word. Father, I pray that right now your word speaks to us. As we, as we hold this word in our laps, Lord, I pray that uh, we have ears to hear, uh, a heart that is ready to receive. And Lord, um, transform us once again. Just uh, elevate our walk with you. Lord, let us be uh, fully, fully alert to where you are leading and calling. We lift this time up to you. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hopefully all of you have your Bibles. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you. Good, 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 good. What about the rest of you? All right. Good, good. No, no, not the phone. Not the phone. Physical Bible. Physical Bible. All right. This is, this, this is not dependent on any other power source. And this is, this is I mean, um, you know, when, when I was, I was uh, looking upon um, Psalm 119, right? Uh, and I was sharing it from this morning, but it, uh, I'm just reminded, do we treasure his word? Do we treasure his word? I hope so. This word is, is, is life, and it... Um, and we want to treat it with awe and reverence. So, so make sure you have your Bibles. Make sure there's dust off of it. Um, and let's, let's treat it with, as if God himself is speaking to us. Because he is. Let me talk about geese for a moment. Geese. You guys have seen geese flying. Uh, I mean, a lot of times they will migrate from, uh, uh, what is it? They migrate to the south, um, uh, to warmer climates. You'll see them flying in a V formation, right? There's, there's actually a lot of, a lot of neat things uh, that I learned about geese uh, this weekend. Um, I know that they, uh, they mate for life. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're very particular uh, about, their, um, about their offspring. They, um, uh, the gos goslings, I think that's what they call it. Uh, anyways, but with regards to geese in flight, there are four things that I wanted to share with you that, that are so amazing at least for me. Um, in that V formation, typically that, that one in the front uh, will rotate around with other, other geese, right? They rotate, they, uh, they rotate their leadership. So there's not always one that's always flying in the lead formation, but uh, another one will come into its place. Another thing, members of the flock create an upward air current for another. <coughs> Uh, there, was, there was this one article that I read where uh, flying in this V formation, uh, long story short, can actually extend uh, their range, their flight range, by 71%. Flying in this, uh, this formation, and it creates, a, it creates a wake, it creates a, um, uh, just a, a dynamic situation where they actually are expending a lot less energy to travel uh, a longer distance. And then when one goose gets sick or wounded, two fall out of formation with it and follow it down to help and protect it. So uh, duck season, right? Um, the, the ducks will get shot down, but then a lot of times uh, two of them will fly down with it to, <coughs> uh, to, to care for it until it is uh, well enough to, to fly again. I mean, this is kind of the uh, God's way of saying no, no duck left behind, right? Last one. Geese in the rear of the formation are the ones who do the honking. We often think all the geese are, are honking, right? No, no it's, it's usually the one in the back that is, uh, that is doing the honking. And a lot of it is just to uh, kind of encourage the, uh, the ones up, up front to, to keep moving forward. 
uh, to keep up the pace. But I see all of this as, as like teamwork. You know, some of the greatest movies that I've, I've watched involve such teamwork, right? Helping each other, helping, each other, helping one another, not, not letting one fall down uh, without uh, being picked up. You know, and and, and I see, we see it in, in nature, we see it in, uh, in ourselves, and I see it in this letter. This letter, uh, these two letters, 2 John and 3 John, it's talking about the way we love one another pleases the Lord. Just kind of making it uh, short here. Let's, let's take a look at 2 John. So this is a letter that the Apostle John uh, wrote most likely to the church in Ephesus. The letter starts off with, with a greeting, verses 1 through 3. Just looking at uh, 2 John right now. Verses 1 through 3, we're, we see John um, addressing the church. Uh, this, in verse 1, the elder, speaking of himself, to the elect lady, uh, the church, and her children, the congregation, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also, also all who know the truth, because of, of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace and mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Christ, Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. Typical greeting. We're going to see this, um, something similar in uh, Third John, except it's much more specific to a person. Verse 4 in uh, 2 John. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Now, verses 4 through 6, John expresses this, this great joy that he has. And it's because he finds this church walking in the truth. They're living out the, the, the commandments of God. And verse 5, it's important to note this. And I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing it, writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now we see why he rejoices. He, he, he's either hearing this or, or seeing this for himself, and, and he's writing back to them and saying, I am so excited when I visit your church and I see all of you, or at least most of you, some of you, living out this commandment. It's not a new commandment. It's one that we've known all along, that you love one another. This, this commandment of loving one another. If the Apostle John were to walk into our congregation right now, would he be able to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around and I'm so excited to see that each of you are walking in the Lord, walking with Christ, seeing you love one another. Right, this, this commandment that is, that is not new, it's something that we've heard all along. And obviously, this is very, very particular to John because in John's letter, um, he wrote um, about the new commandment, right? John chapter 13. This new commandment uh, that Jesus gave love one another uh, as I have loved you. And so he talks about it once again. Man, I'm, I'm so excited to see how you have been loving one another. I am excited. So, so happy to see that. Verse 6, And this love, and this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Now he gets a little bit more serious. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus in the flesh, such, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. What is he saying here? He's expressing this, this burden. He knows that there are people walking amongst them, maybe even inside the church, <coughs> excuse me, that are, that are not of Christ. They don't have this relationship with Christ. And they're teaching all these other things, uh, things of this world, things, uh, things that you, you probably hear in the news and whatnot. They, they're trying to 
uh, to, to divert our attention away from what, what God has been uh, trying to get across to us all along. That because of this relationship that we have with Jesus, recognizing who he is, that he, in this relationship he calls us to not only love God, but to love, have this love for one another, there are going to be people coming in to, to say, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. But they are deceiving. Let's not lose our ways. Let's not lose that, uh, that full reward. It's not to say that if we follow uh, these people that we're going to lose our salvation. But we will miss out on the larger reward that, that he wanted to give, give to us. Verse 9. And this is, I think this is a very important verse here. In fact, if you have the opportunity, highlight it, underline it. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Which one are you? <coughs> Everyone who goes on ahead, the, probably the, the best way to understand this in the Greek, it's any, anyone who, uh, who, who teaches above this, who goes way beyond who, who, everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Do we, do we have that fruit in our lives? Do we, do we exhibit that? Everyone, whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, this is not a moment for us to judge one another, but this is an opportunity for us to take a look at ourselves and ask the question, Am I abiding in, in, in the Word, in His teaching? Because if I, if I am, then I am, then what do, we, what do we see? We have both the Father and the Son in our lives. Do you have Jesus in your, in your life? Are you abiding in Him? Because now we're starting to reverse engineer this. Does John have reason to rejoice when he comes into this place and he sees us and he says wow you are living it out you are loving one another why because i see god in you i see christ in you and and, and you have the father you have the son if, if anyone verse 10 if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works now, this sounds harsh, right? If anyone who comes in and, and does not share this teaching, that the, this teaching of Christ, don't support him. Don't fund him. Don't help him in any way. It's like, wow, what, that's, that's harsh, John. What are you trying to get across here? We have to understand this through the context of the first century community. You have a lot of itinerant teachers coming through your town, and they're dependent on the hospitality of, of, the, of the village, of the residents there. And so when these false teachers, and we talk a lot about false teachers in, in 1 John, in 2 John, in 3 John, all these false teachers will come through town. Do not support them. Do not show hospitality to them. Do not fund them. Do not help them. It's going to look a little bit differently for us today. Because we, we don't offer homes to, uh, our homes to, to visiting pastors or teachers or whoever. We have hotels for that, right? Or Airbnb. But back then, they didn't have such things. And so what John is saying here, it's so important to recognize the teachings of Christ. Is it evident in our lives? Is it evident in the lives of these teachers that are coming, coming through town is it evident in, in the people that we are hosting, that we are, we are sharing, uh, sharing our meals with? It's so important. Be on guard. Be on guard. Let's turn to 3 John, just for a moment here. And I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about this. 3 John takes what was uh, shared in 2 John, but is more specific to a person. So now this letter, 
verses 1 through 4, we see that it is addressed to this man named Gaius, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly with the brothers uh, when the brothers came and testified of your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He's hearing this news about this one man, this one individual who is living out this, this Christ-centered life according to the teachings of Jesus. And he rejoices in that. I would love to be a recipient of this letter, right? I hope you do too. But watch what he goes next, starting from verse 5. Verses 5 through uh, 8, he talks, uh, talks about this, this hospitality that Gaius has been showing. Beloved, it is a faithful thing that you, thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Gaius is receiving these people who are doing the work of God, showing them hospitality, sending them off as if, as if they were practically God himself, right? Showing such support for such workers. And in doing so, we are essentially partners, fellow workers with that effort. When was the last time you helped someone share the gospel? Do you know someone that, that is so in love with Jesus, that, that is going out there on a, on a weekly, daily basis, evangelizing, sharing, and, and, and doing all these things at, at a great cost to himself or herself? Have you turned around and said, let me support you, so that you can continue doing the work of God in all these different areas. You know, we often talk about going on missions, right? We often say, oh, I don't want to go on missions. I want to be the one who supports. Well, this letter is for you. You don't want to go on a mission trip? Then you better be the best supporter of the person that is going out on a mission trip. You want to be the one that is uh, showing that, you know, we may not have that that need to show, show hospitality, but man, are you being the best supporter, empowering this person to go on these trips, to be able to do the work of God, or to, to, to go to the street corner, and to, or to go to the workplace and share? Because we may not want to do that, but we certainly want to support the people that are doing that. And here, John really just is so, so happy about about what this Gaius guy is doing. But then we turn to verse 9. Verses 9 through 11. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, verse 11, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. What he's saying here is there's this one church leader. And this church leader is actually doing contrary to the work of God. Here you have uh, Diotrephus. Diotrephus. What does he do? He puts himself first. He doesn't acknowledge the authority of of, of the church. He doesn't acknowledge the authority of of the apostles. And John is saying, I'm going to bring this up with him. But recognize what he's doing. What is he doing? He's, first he's, he shows no respect to the leadership. In fact, he, he talks, he slanders them. He does not show hospitality to, to fellow brothers and sisters. And then on top of that, 
anyone who does want to do this. He says, no, stop it. Don't do it. No, you're going to continue doing it. You're out of the church. This is a man who is bent on destroying the church, taking the leadership that he has and, and using it for his own gain. He is not for the church. He is not for building up the fellowship. He's not for the, uh, the work of God. And what, is, what does John say? Do not imitate evil. Do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. And then he finishes off with, it, with verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We, we, add, we also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. So John gives approval for the workers, but he has this sharp rebuke for the people that are not building up the church. They're not for the work of God. You know, I talk about this teamwork. I talk about uh, this, these geese that are flying in this, uh, this V formation, right? It's not that uh, uh, one geese is telling another geese, hey, you should be in the back honking. You should take up the rear. I want to lead. No, you don't see that. You see them all working together for the benefit of the entire, uh, entire flock that is flying. All of the gospel speak to us being that team working together to advance the gospel agenda, to share the gospel, because times are dark right now. If you've, if you've looked at the news lately, times are dark. We ought to be worried about our next generation. We ought to be worried about the kids and the, uh, and the, the future, if at all, that they're going to be growing up into. You know, this is the time where we need to, to do everything we can to advance the good news of Jesus Christ, to get the word out, to, to share that hope with everyone. I have a question for you. How can you help others advance the gospel? Maybe we're not the ones going out there sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, sharing our testimonies, right? Right? Maybe we've, we've told ourselves for years, no, oh, that's not for me. No, I'm not going on a mission trip. No, I don't want to go and, and, and witness to my coworkers or anything of that sort. Well, then let's turn it around. Then. How are you helping others to keep the, the gospel moving forward? Are you playing a role in this? Are you a, a part of the team? Because if we know how good Jesus is, if we've experienced him, if we have seen what he has done in our lives, if you, if you experience his miracles, if you experience uh, a miracle of some sort in your life and you've been changed by it, you need to be a part of advancing the gospel, either being at the front lines or being that support team. And this, the, these two letters talk about uh, the hospitality, the support, uh, the love that is found in this, in this community that builds up these workers that are going around and, and teaching and sharing uh, about the good news of Jesus. They are work, fellow workers of the truth. What about you? My point is this. A true believer, the true believer, lives a life that builds up the kingdom workers. We are here to help build each other up, to help advance that kingdom message. We are here to build up those kingdom workers. You know, if, if you think about the, the teachers, the, uh, the, the youth teachers, the children's ministry teachers, the youth pastors, the children's pastors, when was the last time we supported them and empowered them and enabled them to, to really do their very best to teach these kids? This is what, it's, what, it's, what these letters are calling us to do. This is, this is not new teaching. This is something that has been there all along, loving one another. Here's my challenge to you. For this week, find a kingdom worker. Sorry, it may be hard to read, but it says support a kingdom worker this week. 
Who is that kingdom worker that you know? Who is that person that is in the front lines, who is out there, who is, who is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, making sure that one more person hears the word? Do you know, do you know such a person? Find a way to support that person. Take that person out to lunch. Uh, help that person uh, with, with uh, resources. You know, they, you need more Bibles here. Let me, get, let me order a bunch of Bibles for you and, and, and give it to you so that you can go and, and, and share it with a few more people. But my challenge to you is this. Let's support the kingdom workers this week. Let's be really good supporters. Let's bow our heads. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. I want you to examine your hearts right now. And, and ultimately, it comes down to, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Because if you do, what I'm talking about here is going to resonate with you. What I'm talking about here prompts you to say, yes, I need to be, I need to be loving my fellow brothers and sisters. I need to be that good host. I need to be that good supporter. Because I love Jesus. Because I love his word. Because I, I am a fellow worker of the truth. I want to be of God. I want to have God and Christ in me. Because if the truth resides in us, we feel the tug to go and support those who are out in the field right now. Whether it's missionaries, whether it's servants, whether it's just your small group leaders, support them this week. Encourage them. Build them up so that the Word of God can continue to move forward. Because in doing so, not only glorifies the Lord, but it pleases Him. Because that is the way of a true believer. Is the Lord revealing to you what you need to do? Will you be obedient to that? Lord, Heavenly Father, I lift up to you, my brothers and sisters. Right now, I I truly believe you are speaking to each and every one of them right now. You're revealing a name. You're revealing a worker, a kingdom worker. And Father, I pray, (coughs) I pray that you give us that courage, that wisdom, that emboldened character to be able to rise up and support the work of advancing your word in a world that is so dark right now. And the only hope is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that this week will be a week where many, many more people will come to know the name of Jesus because we are supporting the workers. Let it all culminate in glory to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name.